My preaching this morning is based upon the passage in the very first, uh, very first verses in Matthew. Uh, let us read the Word of God and then we'll pray. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. The genealogy of our Savior. The genealogy of our Savior. This is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judas, or Judah and his brethren. And Judas begot Phares and Sarah of Tamar, and Phares begot Esrom, and Esrom begot Aram. And Aram begot Aminadab, and Aminadab begot Nason, and Nason begot Salmon. And Salmon begot Booz or Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz or Booz begot Obed of Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king, and David the king begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. And Solomon begot Rehoboam, or Roboam, and Roboam begot Abiah, and Abiah begot Asa, and Asa begot Josaphat, and Josaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Ozias. And Ozias begat Jotam, and Joatam begat Achaz, and Achaz begat Ezekias, and Ezekias begat Manasses, and Manasses begat Amon, and Amon begat Josiah, and Josiah begat Jeconiah, and his brethren. About that time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salatiel, and Salatiel begat Zorobabel. And Zerubbabel begat Abiud, and Abiud begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Sadok, and Sadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliud, and Eliud begat Eliazar, and Eliazar begat Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that you will open our heart, open our eyes today, that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. We thank you for your inspired word um, that you have given to us this morning. Be with us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> My preaching this morning, as you may have noticed, will be based upon the genealogy of our Savior. If you will be honest, and if you will be sincerely honest, some of you, some of us, might have actually skipped this part. But it's understandable. We, we are not Jews. We are not, you know, we are not Israelites. But for the Jews, these are really important history. And my prayer this morning, my prayer this, uh, this uh, hour is that you may see the wonder of this particular passage in the scripture so that we may not skip this again next time. So that also we may uh, firmly believe that every word in your Bible, in our Bible, is the inspired word of our Lord. And if it's inspired, then profitable for godliness and training as well. So we have here... The Word of God, found in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. My message this morning is summarized in this. A bit, a bit wordy, but hopefully you will uh, grasp and understand the context of this. The message is this. The graciousness of our Lord is shown and bestowed upon many through history. Upon many through history but ultimately through the fulfillment of God's covenant as embodied through our Savior, Jesus Christ. So a bit wordy here, but also hopefully you have your hand out with you as well. That is my message to us. We can see the graciousness of our Lord, not only on your life, not only on your particular lifetime, but the history of the grace of our Lord is ever present. And let me tell you, the grace of our Lord will always, always, always be there throughout history. It is for eternity to eternity. And we can see here the ultimate embodiment of the graciousness of our Lord. God has been gracious to you, not because he has given you material stuff. God has been gracious to you, not only because he has given you life. God 
has been gracious to you because he has sent our Savior, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. So for this morning, I would like to hopefully outline our preaching into three, uh, three headings. It will all start with grace. And now, first heading is this, grace emphasized through the covenants. Grace emphasized through the covenants. Number two, we can also say grace exposed through history. Grace exposed through history. And then lastly, grace embodied through Jesus Christ. So hopefully an outline that you can all follow. The writer of this book, just very briefly, is, is Matthew, as you are all aware. He's also called Levi. He was a tax collector. He was a sinner, just like you and me. He has followed our Lord, and he has become his disciples. The overall theme of this particular book is to show that Jesus Christ is, is, to, is the long-awaited Messiah of the Jew. This book is particularly written for the Jews, really, because some of the passages and some of the phrases here are not translated in Greek. Uh, but just stayed on the actual words because the, the audience really is for the Jews. But also, so some of you will be aware that at the end of the book, Matthew 28, verse 20, we are commanded by our Lord that the gospel should not just be isolated in Judea, but it should also be proclaimed to the whole wide world. Because the gospel, dear friends, dear brothers, and dear sisters, the gospel is for you, for us, for sinners just like us. Although here, uh, we can see also here on this gospel account that Jesus is portrayed as the king. He is the king. He is the king. We can see here at just the point of this, um, of this uh, genealogy as well to trace back his royal lineage, his majestic line. Okay? So here we can see Jesus Christ as our Lord. And as our Lord and as our King, He has messages for His kingdom too. On this particular book, uh, we have plenty of chapters here, but there are famous passages included here that some of you may be aware. We have the discourse of our Lord in the mountain, the Sermon on the Mount. We have also here the parables in Matthew 13. We have also here uh, the parables of the, in relation to the kingdom in Matthew 13. And also we have here the Olivet Discourse, the, the, the fulfillment and eternal reign of the kingdom of God. Wonderful book. Wonderful book that I would love to explore with you if given the chance here. So here we can have the first one, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Here Matthew is tracing back again the, legit, the legitimacy, the heritage, and rights of the man called Jesus Christ. He's not just an ordinary man. His lineage is of a kingly descent. He is the promised king. He is the long-awaited Messiah from the line of Judah. So we can see here, let's jump in now to our first heading. The first heading is grace emphasized through the covenants. Grace emphasized <clears throat> through the covenants. Verse 1, let me read this. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Brothers and sisters, we must realize the weightiness of the opening words of the New Testament. For 400 years, the Lord has been silent. The Lord has not sent any prophet at all. Yet when the book of Matthew has opened, we are given here with the majestic word that this is the generation of Jesus Christ. Here we can see the great truths of the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity. We talked about just a while ago, be him being wounded because he was a real, truly human being. He came into the world. He was really wounded for your transgression. Here we can see the one who is from eternity past entered time and history. He who is God, truly God, became God-man. He is the ultimate power. He has the ultimate power and sovereignty, yet became a babe 
in the manger. Oh, what a glorious truth. Oh, what a glorious picture that we have. Great indeed is the mystery of godliness that Jesus Christ came into the world. That he became like you, like us, became man. Great indeed. Here we have in this uh, verse the similar words captured to us by the apostle John. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then verse 14, we, are, we know that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. As a Jew, his audience would look at the credentials of the Messiah for 400 years, for, for many, many oppressions of, of the Roman uh, Empire. They are looking for a Savior. Are you the Messiah? Are you the promised one? Are you the Christ? Now let me, let me, let me verify that. Are you from the line of Judah? Are you the son of David? But here in this book, this is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. He is the truly son of David, the true son of David, and the true son of Abraham. And that is what we're going to look on this uh, just very briefly, some subsections here on this first point. Number one, look at this. He is called the son of David. He is called the son of David. But secondly, also, he is called the son of Abraham, <clears throat> son of David. David, as we know, is the majestic king of Israel. He is the chosen one of God. He is the apple of God's eye. We remember uh, David's exploit against, against Goliath and the Philistines. David is the savior. David is the king at, at, the, at the minds of the Jews. He is. He is the one who has, who has uh, led us against the battle against our enemies. But all this time, David here, we can see, uh, he, has, he has gone through many difficulties through his life, especially during the reign of King Saul. But all this time, David trusted in the covenant of our Lord to him. This is something found in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 16. 2 Samuel chapter 12, sorry, chapter 7, verses 12 to 16. Let me just read this verses to you. It's just really important here. And why that when and when thy days be fulfilled, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of the out of thy bowels. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But thy mercy shall not depart away from him. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And that is the promise to David. Your kingdom will be forever. 400 and many, many years after that, all Israelites were saying, Lord, have you promised that your kingdom will be established forever? Yet here we are, we are bowing to, to, to the Roman emperor. We are conquered by, by foreign nation. Has your, have, you, have you been faithful to your promise? Here God promised that he will establish David's kingdom forever. He, we will say later on that David has a son whose name is Solomon. He has become successful and wealthy and a powerful king. Maybe during that time they were looking at, oh, Solomon will be here forever. He will establish the kingdom of God forever. But you know the life of Solomon. You know how powerful and how corrupt he became. You know after, after his life, after his reign, the kingdom of God has been torn into two. You know after the kingdom of God has been torn into two, the one in the north, the one in the south, the north has actually been exiled and they have gone into idolatry. They have forsaken our Lord. And on the, uh, soon years afterward, Judah, the kingdom of Judah has failed as well. 
And then they have nothing. They were out in their land. They were exiled out of the land. And here we are. Lord, are you still true? Have you lied to us, O Lord? What is your, this covenant that you have been telling us? Well, we have no king. We have no son of David. But here in this opening verses, the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. This verse in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, ought to remind us, dear brothers, dear church, that God is not a man that he should lie, nor had he spoken that he shall not make it good. Dear brothers, dear sisters, dear church, our God is a faithful God. You know, you know yourself that God has been faithful to you throughout many years that you have known him. But God is faithful from eternity to eternity. As the new covenant and this new testament has been opened up to us through the books of Matthew, the Lord is reminding his people that he is faithful. He has kept his words. And here we go. We have Jesus Christ, the son of David. The Lord has been silent for 400 years. And the people may be asking, has the Lord abandoned us? Has the Lord failed to keep his promise? Is there still a coming king? Or has he altogether, altogether lied to our fathers? But here we are. Here we are. He is the true king. Born with the royal lineage. Born with the legal right to the throne of Israel. He is the true king. He is the king of kings. Through his sacrifice on the cross, God has bestowed on him the name that is above every name. That every knee will bow down to him. I don't know who is your king, but there is something true that one day every one of us will bow down to the true king of heaven and the earth. Yet on the third day he died. That's true for you and for your sins. The Lord died. Yet on the third day he rose again victorious, crowned with many crowns, victorious over dead, and is now seated forever as our king. Jesus is the king. He is the son of David. He is reigning now and he will reign forever and ever. Here is the book of the generation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the son of David. That's why we cry out in our hymns just a while ago. Crown him with many crowns. The lamb upon the throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem, anthem drowns. O oh, music. But its own. Awake my soul, O oh, sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as thy matchless king for all eternity. He is our eternal king. Tomorrow, tomorrow will be, as you're aware, it's a wonderful day, public holiday, to comm commemorate the king of the commonwealth. Well, this time, last year, we commemorate another monarch who is now dead, who is now dead. Oh, brothers and sisters, unlike the monarchs of this world, the Lord our King will live forever and ever. Well, from eternity to eternity, truly the words of God has been fulfilled when Samuel wrote, And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Jesus is the real son of David. I wonder, brothers, if you are doubting the word of our Lord. I wonder, brothers and sisters, if you are like the Israelites, the Jews during that time, before the entry of the babe in the manger in the world, doubting God's promises, doubting God's word and covenant, he will keep his promise, dear brothers. And that's what my encouragement to you. The Lord is a faithful God. He has kept his promise. He will always keep his promise to you. Psalm 9 verse 10. Psalm 9 verse 10. And they know that thy name will put, and they that know thy, thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, O Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Seek the Lord, brothers and sisters. Trust in Him. Trust in Him. He will not forsake you. He has never forsaken anyone who has called on Him. You may have abandoned God. You may have forsaken our Lord. 
But he has not abandoned you. He has not abandoned you, dear brothers, you, dear sisters. He has not forsaken you. I wonder, brothers also and sisters, if Jesus is your king, if Jesus is your king, would you actually sincerely uh, saying as well, king of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Have you pledged your allegiance to the real king of the heavens and the earth? Have you offered your life? Have you offered your talent? Have you given everything for him and for his kingdom? If not, why not? Why not? Why would you serve other kings? Well, why would you serve other kingdoms? Why would you serve that which whoever doesn't, who don't, didn't die for you at all? Who has not been faithful to you? Come to the gracious king. Bow your knee to the one who has given your life to you. So he is the son of David. But notice here also, secondly, on this section here, he is also called the son of Abraham. The son of Abraham. Verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Here, we are not only directed to the royal lineage of Jesus, but also to his identity. He is the true son of Abraham. He is a Jew, a real Jew. He is, his father is Father Abraham. He belongs to the chosen people, the Israelites themselves, the heir to the promise of God. He is the true, he's real son of Abraham. But just like David here, God promised, remember, a covenant to Abraham as well. God promised a covenant to Abraham. This is found in Genesis chapter 12. Verses 1 to 3, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And then uh, later on in Genesis 22, verse 18, let me just read Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee. And curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And then reiterated on Genesis chapter 22 verse 18. Genesis chapter 22 verse 18. And in thy seed shall all the nation of the earth be blessed. Because thou hast obeyed my voice. Here we have the covenant of God to Abraham. Follow me, Abraham, and in this I will promise to you. Follow me, Abraham. Leave everything behind and make me your God, and I will bless you. And in fact, in Genesis 22, your seed, your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Here again, we have this picture of the covenant of God through Abraham, and through indeed that the Lord has blessed the immediate son of Abraham. The immediate son of Abraham was Isaac. Isaac. The Lord has blessed Isaac with many people. The Lord has blessed Isaac with, with many possessions. But ultimately, this word has been fulfilled through Jesus, the ultimate son of Abraham. Just like Isaac, just like Isaac, Jesus was the only begotten son of God. Just like Isaac, Jesus was offered to, but he was the ram. He was the lamb. He was the sacrifice for my sin and for your sin. And just like Isaac, we have proven indeed that God is Yahweh Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, God who provides the sacrifice, and that sacrifice is in the cross for you and for me. That's why Galatians chapter 3 verse 16 is an important passage. Uh, read, we will read this again. Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed, singular, were the promises made. He said not to seeds as to many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Jesus Christ. The point of the Paul here, point of Galatians here is saying that this promise to Abraham has been fulfilled not through Isaac, but through Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, and what's the, what's the, 
What's, what's the takeaway for us for this? Well, brothers and sisters, you are, you are, we, uh, through Jesus, the son of Abraham, he has born many sons of glory. Here we are. We don't even have, you know, if we trace our lineage in a way. Some of us came from different places. Some of us came from different countries. Some of us can, uh, can, uh, can, uh, came from different continents. But probably none of us can trace back our roots through Abraham. But no, no, through the son of Abraham, through Jesus Christ, we have become sons of Abraham too. How, how, how can you say, dear brothers, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you did not become, uh, you become then a son of Abraham. You brothers are testament to it. You sisters can testify, testify to it from many tongues, from many nations. He has called his people. It is true, our Lord. It is true, our Savior, that he has called many sons. Look at this picture. Just wonderful, wonderful picture here. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, and kindred, and people, and of tongues, and stood, all of them, all of us, all of our truly sons of Abraham, all of us standing before the throne of God with all the multitudes of believers three in Christ from the first generation to the next generation from many countries all throughout gathered. And look at this, what are they doing? They are before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, crying out, Jesus Christ is our Lord, he is the true king. He is the true king. We can see, brothers and sisters, as we wrap up this section here, that indeed God's grace is shown and emphasized through the covenants we have just briefly explored. Where is grace in this? Where is grace in this? Well, God could have easily abandoned Abraham. God could have easily abandoned and forget David. Abraham and David, though mighty men, are sinful men. Abraham sinned against God. David sinned against God. Yet the Lord chose to keep his promise. It is covenant, brothers and sisters. A covenant that will love, the Lord will love his people. This is grace, dear brothers and sisters, that we have been given what we don't deserve at all. God kept his promise. Not because of you, but because he is a faithful God. He is a faithful God. Despite our sinfulness, you can come to Him. He made a promise that those who call upon Him will be saved. It is a settled promise. It is a never dying covenant. Will you come to Him now? Will you at this moment believe? Would you try the faithfulness of our Lord? Try it. Taste it. And see the goodness of our Lord. So here we can see the grace of God. Grace of God emphasized through the covenants. Very briefly then, let's move on to the second point. It's the grace exposed through history. It's the grace exposed through history. Here we can see a few observations here on verses 2 to 5. Uh, the, we, we have two items here, God's keeping of his people and God's extraordinary use of ordinary people. It is grace exposed through the history of the Israelites. We can see, and you can read for yourself, verses 2 to 5, the names, very famous names in the, in the Bible here. And we can see names, for example, here we can see first and foremost God's keeping of his people. We can see Abraham, Abraham, in verses 2. How many times the life of Abraham has been in danger? Remember when he was in Egypt, Abraham and Sarah has to lie just to for them to survive. Look at the life of Jacob. Here we can see God's keeping of his people and the 12 tribes. They could have easily been oblit obliterated by a famine ravaging the land. But the Lord kept them through Moses. In Egypt, the people could have been easily annihilated by the, by the Pharaoh. Yet Moses delivered them. Same as well in the history of Boaz, that we, something that we, we have uh, heard a few weeks ago, and Obed and Solomon, 
They were all, they were all sustained and kept by the grace of God. Verses 6 to 11 here, we can see the, the names that, are, that pertain, to, pertain to the kingdoms of God and the kings of Israel and Judah. Verses 6 to 11. We look back as well to the history during the monarchy of Israel. God led them, preserved them through kings. During this time, God could have easily abandoned them. The king themselves led, them, led the people away from God. Yet the Lord has sent multiple prophets during this time, urging them into repentance. You have prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and, and, and Hosea and calling them, repent, repent, call upon the Lord, call upon the Lord. We have here Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 11. Say unto them, this is our Lord, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why, why will ye die, O house of Israel? Here we can see God's keeping of his people. And maybe you will say, what? Well, they, were, they were in exile, remember? The Lord has thrown them out of the land, remember? And even in exile, you can see the lineage of his people. That's the point of this, this passage. You can see the lineage. You can see, the, you can see all. You can trace back and say, the Lord has been faithful in this generation. The Lord has kept his people in this generation. And even in the darkest times, the Lord has still kept his promise. Why? Because I can still trace the roots. I can still see the history of grace throughout here we can see verses 12 to 15, verses 12 to 15, the names of the people that, are, that were in exile. Brothers and sister, sisters, God is keeping his people. He is keeping his people. He which had began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Will bring it into completion until the day of our Lord here we have also Revelation chapter 7 verse 4. I heard, this is the 144,000, but I heard the number of them which were sealed. They were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Here we have a picture of those who are sealed in Christ. But the, we, may, uh, we may argue what this passage truly means, but ultimately we will come up to the conclusion that God has preserved His people until the very end. That's the point of this passage. God has preserved His people. We have here a genealogy of Jesus Christ as a living testament of God's faithful keeping of His people until He accomplished His purpose to us. Again, brothers and sisters, I wonder on a more personal note, if you, if you have been wandering away from the presence of God, I wonder, wandering away from the fellowship of his people at the church, just like the prodigal man in the Count of Luke, wandering away and wasting your life, wasting your life in the, sea, life, in the life of sin and of the world. And you may say, Lord, Maybe God may now abandon me. Maybe God can now forsake me. No brothers, no sisters. God is keeping you. And here you are. Testament to the grace of God. You can still hear these words. These are not my words. But this is the grace of God through his word. Urging you into repentance. And saying to you, you are mine. And, and, and you are mine forever. Urging you to come back home to our Lord. He will keep his people. That's the point. This is the assurance that we have in Christ. John 10 verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. This is Jesus Christ uh, uh, explaining this to us. And as if that is not enough. Jesus further emphasized on the succeeding verse, on verse 29. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them 
out of my father's hand. It is grace, dear brothers. It is grace, dear church. Should we then now repent of our sins? And should we then now focus our life in true service of our Lord? And should we then get, should, should it give comfort to us that whatever happens in our life, the Lord will be there. The Lord will keep you. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. You know the words. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Here we can see the grace of our Lord, dear church, that we have that assurance. Grace that has been proven in the past. Grace that is, that is cherished now but also grace that we can rely on the future. Second point in this second um, heading, God's extraordinary use of ordinary people. God's extraordinary use of ordinary people. We can also note here and observe God's extraordinary use of ordinary people like you. We have here different types and characters of people throughout history who has been used by our Lord. We may not be able to grow through each of them uh, individually, but we can recount for you as an example. We can see first here God's use of sinners. God's, God's use of sinners. All of us, dear brothers and sisters, sinned against God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Here we have the same, we are on the same standing as with the saints, sinners before God. We have people like Abraham. Abraham has been used by God, but Abraham is a serial liar. Serial liar. He wants to distort the truth just to get what he wants. He lied in Egypt in Genesis 12. He lied with his friend Abimelech in Genesis 20. Well, say, hey, how about Isaac? Isaac is a good man. Well, Isaac has his favoritism. He, he loves Esau. He just wants to give everything to him. Well, Rebecca has his, her, her own favorites too, Jacob. Well, look at Jacob. Oh, God used Jacob. Oh, look, my, Jacob, the saintly Jacob. No, no, brothers, Jacob is a lying, cunning, deceiver. He was deceived by his brother-in-law, and he, as a revenge, deceived him back. Well, we can even move on with Judah. Jacob's son, who was self-righteous, in reality has committed incest against his daughter-in-law, Tamar. Well, we can move on to David, too, the mighty David. The mighty David. But God told him himself, God himself told his hands are full of bloodshed. The mighty David, the adulterer and the murderer, yet used by our Lord. Used by our Lord. It is by the grace of our Lord that we are accepted in the beloved dear church. It is all grace. And we can line up all these faithful men in the Bible that all of them are sinners just like you and me. But shouldn't this encourage you, dear brothers? Shouldn't this encourage us, dear, dear church, to serve the Lord too? We are all sinners saved by grace. And by grace too, the Lord partnered with us for the furtherance of this kingdom. As you read through this genealogy, remember they are not the mighty men of God. They are sinful men of God that has been saved by our Lord. Just like you, just like me. So God's use of sinners. Secondly, we can see God's use of women too. God's use of women too. What is remarkable about this genealogy of our Lord are the mention of women. So in other genealogies, all men. Okay, uh, he's the father of this and the father of this and the father of this and the son of this. Okay, God is also here. We can notice not only using men for His kingdom but also the women too. And dear sisters, I hope that you are encouraged in whatever uh, state of life that you are to serve the Lord in whatever capacity that you have. Look at this, Tamar, Tamar. Tamar was here mentioned. The Lord has showed grace to her. This story is found in Genesis 38. I'm going to leave the story to you. But she sold herself as a prostitute to her father-in-law, Judah, to bring forth Paris and, and Sarah. Rahab, we have just talked about Rahab. She was a Gentile prostitute for whom God took ordinary measures to save from both judgment and her lifestyle of prostitution. 
We have Ruth here as well. She was a Moabite, a Gentile, until her conversion out of the covenant of Israel. And also lastly here, we have the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba. Yet the Lord has showed grace to these women. And the Lord is encouraging women that he is the, great, that he's the gracious God, not only of men, but also of women, of all the people in this world. I wonder, dear sisters, if you, uh, if you are hesitating to, to serve in whatever capacity, dear sisters, you can by the grace of our Lord. One of the prolific hymn writer is, her name is Fanny Crosby, as you are aware. Uh, she has written wonderful hymns with blessed assurance, uh, all the way my Savior leads me. He has written more than, she has written more than 8,000 hymns and gospel songs with more than 100 million copies printed. She's also known for her teaching and res her rescue mission. And by the end of 19th century, she was a household name. Dear brothers, dear sisters, just like the women of this genealogy, you can be used by God too. You can be used by our King. So here we can see grace exposed through history very briefly. And I hope that is su uh, sufficient for this hour. Lastly then, last heading, grace embodied through Jesus Christ. Grace embodied through Jesus Christ very briefly. Verse 16 to 17. And Jacob we got Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. Lastly now, we can look finally to our Savior. He is, number one, He is the Savior. He is the Savior. His name is Jesus. His name bears His mission. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew chapter 18, verse 11. For the Son of, Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Yes, true indeed that the leaders of other religion became men. They became men. They were human. But only Christianity tells us that the Lord became man to save us. From the misery of our sins. The, other, the, the preachers of other religions are very human. But our Lord alone became man. And the man with a particular mission to save us from the misery of our sins. His name is Jesus. The fairest above all name. He is the Savior. He is your Savior. The reason God graciously kept his people. And kept his promise. Is so that Jesus will be born. That he may save you. Us, those who call upon the name of the Lord. I wonder if you have a Savior. I wonder if you reckon yourself to be your Savior. Or I wonder if you have other Saviors. Or there is only one and His name is Jesus. He is the Savior. His name is Jesus. But lastly, He is also the Christ. The Christ. We have here the title given to Jesus, he is the Christ. The word Christ means the anointed one. Anointed by whom? By our Lord himself, the God the Father, anointing him to be his son. Anointed for what? He was anointed the king of Israel in the same manner that David was anointed as a king. Well, on this opening press passages here, we have the generations of our Lord, generation of Jesus Christ. A new king was born, king from the line of David, a king from the line of Abraham. His name is Jesus Christ. So this morning, brothers and sisters, we touch upon three major themes. Grace emphasized through the covenants. Grace exposed through history. And then lastly, grace embodied through Jesus Christ. In closing, may I ask, what is your lineage? What is your lineage? And I say, your spiritual lineage Whose sons and daughters are you now? Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10. He brings many sons unto glory. John chapter 1 verse 12. But as many as receive him, to them he gave he power to become the sons of God. Will you say, David, the son of God. Joshua, the son of God. Come to our Lord. 
is offering free salvation. He is the Savior. He is your Savior. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you again that you came into this world as Jesus, the Savior of this world, and Christ, the Anointed One. We thank you, Lord, that as we look back, short uh, review of the history, O oh Lord, we can see grace throughout. Lord, kept, keep the word in our hearts today that we may uh, benefit from it, and may those who has not called upon you may call upon you today, O oh God. Thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you.